Okay, today's daf we're going to be learning is Yoma Daf Tetzayin. Today's daf is sponsored by Julie Landau in honor of Caroline Benari, a wonderful friend in Chavrutu whose example inspired me to begin learning Daf Yomi, which will lead me to my next line, which is the best way to, to, for most people to get involved in Daf Yomi is to see that other people are doing it. So if you like learning Daf Yomi, recommend it to friends because I find most people, the thought of Daf Yomi seems very overwhelming, but if they hear from someone who's doing it, that that it's doable and that someone who's just like them is learning, then I think it usually encourages people. So with that dedication, take it one step farther. And uh, thank you, Julie, for giving us the inspiration. Um, and thank you, Caroline, for being the inspiration. Okay, we're gonna get started now. We started yesterday, if you remember before yesterday, even on Yudalid, we started with this contradiction between the Mishnah in Yoma and then the Mishnah in Tamid. And then we said, oh, don't worry, each is a tradition handed down by somebody else, right? There were different traditions about the Mikdash, and I've said this many times. Today is a good day, by the way, if you have maps and you got your maps, it's a good day to pull out your maps. We'll be using them today. We also have pictures. So if you it's probably recommended uh, to watch the video if possible, so you can see the pictures that we're holding or follow along in the link of the pictures that I'll send out in the WhatsApp groups. Um, so now, the issue always with these maps, as I've said over and over, is that the maps show one approach. And in fact, we're going to see the maps seem to follow the approach in Mesechet Midot, which, which makes sense because that's where it really talks about the Midot of the temple. But as you're going to see, there's discrepancies between the descriptions in Midot and the descriptions in Tamid and also the descriptions in Yoma. And basically, the Gemara's answer there when it brought before they didn't bring in Midot, they brought in Yoma and Tamid. Tamid, again, talked about the daily sacrifices, so there was a lot of description of the temple there, and resolved it by saying, oh, one is Rabbi Shimon Isha Mitzpah, which they said in the end Yoma is, and the rabbi's approach is what you find in Masecha Tamid. The reason why we're bringing our sugar, really it has nothing to do, I mean, I shouldn't say it has nothing to do with anything. It's actually very helpful because we're gonna learn a lot about the temple and all these sugyot are gonna help us understand where things are in the temple. But really it doesn't exactly belong in the Sechet Yoma. And again, you could say there's two reasons why they bring it. Number one, they bring it because it's gonna be the exact same top type of sugya where we have a contradiction between two Tanaitic sources, one in Masechet Tamid, one in Masechet Midot, which is gonna parallel one in Yoma, one in Tamid. And then we're going to say, we're going to resolve this contradiction by suggesting that one follows one approach and the other follows another approach. Now, why are there different approaches? Again, because we're living in the time post-temple. Nobody really knew exactly what happened in the temple. They had traditions passed down by people who were living in the generation, you know, it was also in the time of the temple and also after the temple. But remember, these rabbis also didn't hang out in the temple all the time because they were rabbis, they weren't Kohanim. So even there, there was a, a debate about what exactly went on, right? Rabbi Chanina, Skana Kohanim, we saw in the past, right, that famous sugya, if you remember, those tapim in Shabbat, which were quite complicated. Uh, and in the beginning of, it was in Psachim, right? I can't even remember now. I think it was in Psachim, yeah, in Psachim, actually. Um, they, right, he was a Skana Kohanim and a rabbi. So he was in a good place to be able to tell us these things. But likewise, there must have been other rabbis who knew, but still there were differences of opinions between them, which shouldn't surprise us. So now we're going to deal with this contradiction. The main contradiction that we saw so far, the one contradiction we're going to deal with right now, is that in Masechet Tamid, it talked about the Lishkat Tzleim was on the northwestern side. And in Masechet um, Midot, it said, that was the last line we read, Ma'aravit Romit, Okay, it was in the southwestern side. So now the southwestern corner. So now we have this contradiction between the two. We're going to continue in Mesechet Midot where we left off at the top of our daf. Dromit Mizrachit from the southeast. Okay, that matches, right? There was one. We're going to see there's another difference, which is they talk in Mesechet Tamid about these four Lishakot that were in the Beit HaMokhed. Now we're going to talk, right, four little rooms that were there. In Masech Midot, it also says there were four little rooms, but two of them overlap. One was for the sheep, for the korbanot, and one was for preparation of the bread, the show bread. But now we're going to have different descriptions of the other two. Okay, if you remember from yesterday, one was for the chotamot. These are the tokens. If you remember, they, in Masech HaTshkelim, we learned that they would have tokens for the nisachim, the libations. And then... Um, the other one was for the Beit HaMoked, where there was this fire that was going. 
So now they say, well, according to this tradition, Mizrahit Tzfonit ba ginzu beit cheshmonai avnei mizbeach sheshiktsu machayavan. The Cheshmonaim, after the, the, not destruction, the desecration of the temple in the time of the Greeks, right, the, the, the Hanukkah story. So there were all these stones of the altar that were, that were, um, that were, shikitsum, they were desecrated. So what did they do? They basically said, we're going to leave, right, we, we couldn't throw them away, but they were desecrated, so we can't use them. So they would put them in this room. That's what one of the rooms was used for. And Sfonit Ravit, the northwestern side, there, there was a, a, a staircase, a stairwell that led down to where they would go to the mikvah. Okay, so we now have this description. There's a bunch of differences, but the only difference we're really focusing on right now is this lishkat beit tzlaim and where it was situated. To which Rav Huna answers, "I'm a Rav Huna, man tana midot, Rav Lezer ben Yaakov he, ah, don't worry, midot is one person's tradition, and Tamid has a different tradition. There were different traditions about." where this lishka was, okay? So there you have it. Now, I'm a Rav Huna. Uh, so, uh, sorry, Ditsna. How do we know? He's going to prove. How do we know that Masechet Midot was according to Rav Lezer ben Yaakov? Okay, our structure is going to be very easy for today. I'll kind of set it up already. We have Rav Huna, who's going to say it's Rav Lezer ben Yaakov. We're going to prove, he's going to prove it, how we know that Midot is Rav Lezer ben Yaakov, and therefore Tami must be the rabbis who disagree with him. Then we're going to suggest, we're going to try to further prove this Rebbe Lezer ben Yaakov. We're going to then say, wait, that we're going to say, um, Rav Adabar Ava is going to say, no, you can say that that source is Rabbi Yehuda and not Rebbe Lezer ben Yaakov. And then we're going to reject his attempt to prove that. Okay, so here goes. Uh, so here's Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov's proof. Ezrat Nashim Aitaba Orech Mea Lishloshim Vachamesh, Aroch of Mea Shloshim Vachamesh. We're going to have a lot of numbers today, also the sheets that I'm able to help, and also the pictures are going to help. So the whole Ezrat Nashim, okay, here you can look at your map if you have a map. Okay, here I'll, I'll just show you the picture because this I don't have right now online. But this is the Ezrat Nashim, okay, this is the eastern entrance. You walk into the Temple Mount, you get, to, you know, from the Temple Mount, you walk into where the Mikdash stands. And we'll, we'll talk about this brown and this yellow in a minute. That's the soreg, the outer one, and then the chel, we'll get to that. But then you go in, you're in the Ezra Nashim, there's four basic rooms here, four chambers. So what were they used for? Dromit Mizrachit. So we're gonna start on the southeastern corner, the first one you get to, and on the south side. That's where the Nizirim were. Okay, then uh, now what was that for? It's not like Nizirim, the, the monks hung out there, right? A Nazir, not really a monk, but that's how we translate it, I guess. I don't know, but a Nazir is someone who doesn't drink wine and has all sorts of, doesn't become impure to a dead per, but person, etc. So what would the Nazir do? When the Nazir finishes Nizirim, usually it was a 30-day time period. Shasham Nizirim mevashlim et shalmehem, right? If you remember, they also don't cut their hair. So what would they do? They would cook their korbanot shlamim. They had to bring a slew of korbanot, three different sacrifices. They would cook their korban shlamim because that was the part they ate. Umegalchim sa'aran. They would then shave their hair. Umeshachim tachad hadud. And then they would burn their hair in the, in the flame um, upon which they were cooking their food, their korban shlamim. So that would be done in the lishkat nizlamim. That's what that chamber was used for. Mizrachit Tzvoni. Now we move to, we're still on the east side because that's where we've walked in. We now move to the north side. It's where they kept the wood. This is where the Kohanim who were blemished, who weren't allowed to go into the Azrat Kohanim, so they could only hang out here. So, and they couldn't do the Avoda. So what would they do? They would be, be in that Lishka, in that chamber, and they would, one of the jobs that they would do, they would take the worms out of the wood. What's the wood for? The wood is obviously for burning on, this, on the altar to make a fire. Any wood that has worms in it, worm infested, has, cannot go on the altar and therefore their job was to remove the worms. We now go to the other side of the room, right? This is now already adjacent to, right? Each one was in the corner. So if we're in the corner, that's already adjacent to the azara. So now, right, which is the inner area where everything kind of happens, right? Everything other than the things that happened here. So now we're, we, we started on the south, right? We stayed on the east. So we started the description, 
south southeast. We moved to northeast. Now we're moving to northwest. It's kind of like we're going around the room. Um, and now we get to northwest. This is where the Mitzoraim were. Okay, why was that? Maravit Romi, uh, oh, so wait, they don't tell you. That's because the Mitzoraim, if you remember, is part of their process. You have to put the blood and the oil on their right ear and their right finger and their right toe. And in order to do that, you do it from the Azara, but they can't go into the Azara. So they stand right there on the border and there was an opening where they would be able to do that. And, and yes, in answer to your question, it, once they took out the worms, then they could use the wood. That's why they were busy taking out the worms. Now we go to the south, southwestern side. And here's our important line. Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov says, Oh, I forgot how to do that. Okay. Now, this is a little bit strange. How did he forget how to do that? Right. But he did forget you know, it's what, what that room was. Sorry, not how to do it. He forgot what that room was for. The main point being here, it must have been Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov talking before. So since he was the one talking, then he continues and he says, and by the way, this one I forgot. So it must be, he's the author of Masechet Midot and that's how Rafuna proves. That's why it must be Masechet Midot was Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov. Since you're probably very curious to know, so what was there? It was where they would store wine and oil. Why? Because they needed it for libations. And it was called Beit Shamnaya, which comes from Shemin oil. Okay, and that's where they would store items that they needed, right? And they would be right outside so they could access it easily. I see the question as to how did the Mitzorahim get there? This is the Mitzorah after, they're at the end of their Tahara procedure and they just have one last thing to do. So they've already gone through all the stages of purification. They just have this one last thing. So therefore they're already allowed in, right? But this is part of the end of their process. You have to, and it's like a, Right. How else do you let them finish their process if you can't let them in? So you let them in, but you can't go in all the way to the Azara, so they let them in this area. I'll remind you, the Azrat Nashim is called this not because it was only women. It wasn't like the women's section, okay, even though it sounds like the women's section. It was where women were allowed to be. So it was called the Azrat Nashim because the women could be there, just like we're going to see in a minute. This is Israel Yisrael. It doesn't mean that's where all the Jews were when they came to the Temple Mount. It's just that that was as far as they were allowed to go. Okay, so now. And yes, they would walk through the Ezrat Nashim to get into their chamber, for sure. Okay, so this area was less sanctified, and that's why the Mitzvahim were allowed to be there. Okay? Now, we're now going to have further proof that it's Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov. And to this, Rav um, Adbar Ava is going to say, no, not necessarily, because I could say that that source goes according to somebody else. Hachinami mistaber de Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov. I can further prove that it's Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov. Why? It's none. As it says, here comes the complicated part of today's stuff. Okay, now. We're going to bring a slew of Mishnah from Masechet Midot. If you want the exact reference, I put them on my sheet so you can see where they all come from. We're going to start with Masechet Midot. Um, we're in Perek Bet Mishnah Dalit. Okay, I think if I read the reference right, yeah, Mishnah Dalit. So all the Kotalim, now what walls are we talking about? The Temple was made up of entranceways and then walls above the entranceways. So the question is, how tall were those walls? So according to this, we're now not going to see exactly what their height was, but we're going to see that they were tall. Okay, relatively speaking, they were tall. Hayuk vohim, chutz mikota mizrachi. Other than the wall that led into, like when you're coming from the Harabayit and you walk in through the east, from the east, you're walking kind of facing westward into, you know, if you. If you look westward, them they had all these entrances so that theoretically you could look in one entrance, see in through the next entrance, see in through the next entrance, and basically see into the hechal, right? Or into where at least the hechal is. The hechal is the sanctuary. That's where you have the shulchan, the menorah, um, the mizbech hazaha, the altar, the golden altar. And then in there is the kodesh kodeshi, right? There, obviously, there was a parochet blocking, so you couldn't see in there. But the whole idea is that there's this is this openness here and these entranceways that led one led to the other. And that would all make sense if they were all on one, one flat area. But as we know, we've already discussed, it was on a mountain. So as you go in, it gets higher and higher. Now, if you have these entranceways, okay, we're gonna see how tall they were, but, and you have walls above the entranceways, if 
the inner part gets higher and higher, and it's not the height of the entrance way, right? The opening, the petach, we're going to call it. And let's say the ulam, which is the entrance where you could theoretically, right, look in and see the hechal, is no longer, is higher than the opening, then you're not going to be able to see in, okay? Now the idea here is, we're going to see it right now, I'll just read and I'll read and then we'll see. So all the walls above these open areas, these ptachim, these, open, these openings, entranceways, the walls above them were very high. Other than that eastern wall, why? Haramishcha is another word for Harazetim, the Mount of Olives. He's standing by the Mount of Olives. Now they're assuming, okay, I don't know, because the Mount of Olives is a mountain, but they're assuming that the base of the Mount of Olives, I don't know enough historically, but is the assumption of this figure for sure, is that he's at the same height as the Harabai, okay, the Temple Mount. And then, right, as the Temple Mount goes up, he's going to have to be able to see from his low down point, right? In other words, through that entranceway of the 20 Amok. So if he looks in, you know, he, he's burning the Paraduma. Remember, we do that outside of Haraz 18. We don't do it in the temple. And then what does he do? He sprinkles the blood toward the Hechal. Basically, he sprinkles it toward in the direction of the Hechal. Now, when he does that, he's supposed to see the Hechal. So he, what they say here is, the Kotel Mizrahi, that wall needed to be very low so that he could see over the wall rather than through the entrance, through the opening. Because if you look through the opening, the, because we keep going up in height and we're going to get to all the numbers, the height of the Hechal was so high that you wouldn't be able to, it wouldn't be in your vision if you look through that opening. Because when you look through that opening, you're going to see the you know, what's under the ulam, but not the actual entrance to the ulam, which is the, that little hallway area that entered into the Echa. Because it was higher than 20 amo. That's basically what we're going to have to prove. It was higher than 20 amo. we're going to basically say only according to Rebbe Lezer ben Yaakov. And therefore, this Mishnah must be Rebbe Lezer ben Yaakov, because what he's basically saying is, you're going to, and here's where it gets a little complicated to visualize, but since there's this opening, and you can't see through, if you look straight through the opening, you can only see the height of What's oh right that twenty amo we're going to see which is twenty amo high the ulam is going to be higher than twenty amo so you won't be able to see that so when there's a wall above it the wall is going to have to be very low we'll talk about later how low so that you can actually see over it and through that right we'll be able to see the entrance of the hechal utnam so now let's get into the numbers kol aptachim shayusham govhanesrim ama verochvan eser amo we learned this in in Erevin, if you remember, because we learned a lot of things about Erevin from the temple. So their opening was 10 amo wide. That was always our big opening for, uh, for right, when something's breached, if it's more than 10 amo. So the opening was 10 amo wide, but this is the important part. The height was 20 amo tall. So now, Utnan, here come the pictures now. Lifnim mimenu, from there, where do we get to? The soreg. The soreg is this lattice gate, basically, or a fence that goes around. That's the brown part here that you see all around. This went all around the temple part that was on the temple mount, right? We have the whole temple mount. Then we have, we start to enter through into the, we go first the soleil. Then the next thing we get to, Tznam, we're just basically quoting parts from Mishnayot and Masechet Midot. Lifnimi menu hachel eseramot. So we're now going to learn both about heights and about the length on the, on the ground. So the chel was 10 amot long. So this space of the chel, which we talked about yesterday, which was the space around the temple, is 10 amo long. That's not really important for our purposes. The next thing we get to is, um, we're now going to start talking about all the stairs, and we're going to see pictures of it, which is nice because it'll hopefully help you visualize what this all looked like. So there were, ten, there were 12 stairs that went up. Each stair, and we're going to see all the stairs we're going to talk about other than one stair, are all half an, a cubit in height and half a cubit in length. Okay, the length, again, isn't important to us because right now we're not talking about how much space this took up in the length of the room. We're talking about how much height, how high everything went up. So the, in the chel, from the chel leading to the entrance to the Ezrat Nashim, we have these 12 stairs which basically create a height of six amot. Okay, there's a chart on the second side of the sheet, which is also going to give you all the numbers if you look at the sheet. 
So now we're up six amo from the base level of Harabayat, which again, as we said, is the same base level of the person standing at Harazitim. Tevav ma'alot, olot mitocha, hayordot me'ezra Yisrael le'ezra nashim. Okay, they're actually describing it now, instead of from the inside out, uh, from the outside in, like we were discussing before, we're now describing, we're in picture 32, we're now describing from the Ezra Yisrael into the Ezra Nashim, which is basically, in other words, saying from the Ezra Nashim into the Ezra Yisrael, you have to go up 15 stairs. So now, each stair, room ma'ala chatziyama, v'shulcha chatziyama, again, height of half an ama, and they go in half an ama. So now, again, how much height do we get? If each one is half in ama and there's 15, it's going to be seven and a half. So we now have seven and a half plus the six and a half. We're at a height of 13 and a half cubits. We're already, when we walk into the Ezra Israel, which is the Azara, right? When we walk into there, we're already 15, uh, 13 and a half cubits higher than we were before. Utsnan. Bein ha'ulam lamizbeach. Okay, we're now going into the temple. And now we get. We walk into the temple, we're on now the left side of the picture number 33. You walk into the temple from the eastern side, right? That's Sharni Kanu. You have a few areas we're going to talk about. Bain Ha'ulam Lamizbeach, okay? Right now, the next place you go up in height, although we're going to see this another place, but right now we're going to skip that. We're going to talk about between the Ulam to the Mizbeach. Again, we're, we're, we're working from the other direction, which again, I would rather look at it going in. So you get to the altar beyond the altar until you get into the ulam, which is where we're talking about. How much height is there? Kaf bet ama, okay? So first of all, we're talking length. The whole area was 22 amo. Ushtem esrei ma'alot ayusha. There were 22 stairs, uh, 20, uh, sorry, 12 stairs there. Rum ma'ala chatziyama v'shecha chatziyama. Another 12 stairs. So we're going up another six and a half cubits. So we've gotten to, we were up to 13 and a half. We're now at 19 and a half. Okay, if we stop here, let's go back to my original picture. We have an opening from Harazetim, right? That we're, when you're looking at Harazetim, you look through the entranceway from the Harabayat into the temple area. You have 20 cubits of height. If you look there, and if the height was only 19 and a half where the ulam is, that's what we want to see, you would see at least a half, you, know, you would get to see a half an ama from your vision there, from your, right? Because it goes up, 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 up. So from that entranceway, you'd see the very top, the very bottom half ama, right? Using the very top space of that entranceway, you would see a little bit of the ulam. So you'd be okay. But we want to prove that th this Mishnah, remember it said, the wall above it has to be very low so you can see, which means you couldn't see through the opening. You'd have to see by looking over the opening, okay, from the area above it, because the opening wouldn't give you a vision of it. So therefore, they're going to say, that must be Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov. Why? Utsnan, it says in the Mishnah, Rabbi Lezer ben, ya uh, Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov Omer, Ma'ala haitashan. Oh, wait, there was one other stair that we forgot to mention. According to Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov, now you see this brown on this over here. If we go back into the Eastern entrance, you walk into the Ezra Yisrael. Now the first, we'll see this in, in a little bit later today. The first 11 Amod on the ground, okay, are called Ezra Yisrael. The next 11 cubits between there and the altar until you get to the altar, there's basically 22 cubits from there until you get to the altar. 11 were called Ezra Yisrael and the next 11 were called Ezra Kohani. And there was, here's a better picture in 34, there was a stair to get from the Ezra Yisrael to the Ezra Kohanim, according to Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov, okay? Which means we're going to be higher up, which means we're going to, our vision's going to be blocked because instead of 19 and a half, we're going to see there was this step, Malai Tasham, Ugvo Ama. This is the one step that was a whole cubit tall. It was one big step. And that makes everything, the height of the Ulam, 20 and a half. And already that's going to explain why we can no longer see into that space, okay, from the opening, which is why we're going to need to look over. So we're going to have a short wall. We'll talk in a minute about how short in order to be able to see. Now, there, there's this There was a duchan on this step, okay, then we're now talking about this one step. There was a bit of a platform, and it was three steps with a half an ama each. Now, according to Rashi, that's this picture here, 
they didn't take up any space on the floor. They didn't make the floor go up another amma and a half. And that's why we only get to 20 and a half. According to another interpretation, we can see here Tosfot Yishanim and other Rishonim, it actually was part, and they would get actually get up to 22 cubits. Okay, so whether it's 20 and a half cubits or 22 cubits, either which way it's above 20, in which case you're not going to be able to see. So here comes our Gemara. If you're going to say the Mishra's Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov, that's why when he's standing at Haraz 18, the Kohen who's burning the para, he can't see through that opening because the Ulam is already higher than with the, the line of vision of those 20 cubits. But But if you're, say, according to the rabbis, there's still that half an amma at the very bottom, right? The very top of your vision where you can see the very bottom of the entrance to the ulam. You could see the entrance through there. So therefore it must be it's Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov. That's their proof. Now let's talk about the height of the wall because they don't really say that here. Um, but if we talk about it, this is the way it works. If you remember, we said that the next the next miflas up, right? After that, we go up six amo when we go into the Ezrat Nashim, which means that the next entrance way, there's a good picture in the, in the Schottenstein of this, if you have it. Um, the next entrance way is gonna start six cubits of height off the ground and go up again, 20 cubits. So now the height of that opening is 26 cubits. So if the wall above the first entrance way that's on ground level, is six cubits or more, then you won't have any vision because when you look from above that height, you'll be blocked by the next wall of the next space. You follow? Because the next space wall is at 20, right? It already has a wall at 26 cubits of height. So basically that wall is gonna have to be less than six cubits so that you'll be able to see through the next entranceway. So you're not blocked by the next wall above the entranceway. So that's why that wall has to be very low so that less than six cubits of height so that you'll be able to see inside at that height. And then you can see, right, the hechal because the hechal is already there. The hechal is not higher than that. So, cause it's either 20 and a half or it's 20, we said uh, 20, it would be 22 according to the one who adds another one and a half cubits of that Duchan. Okay, so that's our explanation of why the Mishnah there must be Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov. We have a further proof that the Mishnah is Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov. To which Rabbi Adi bar Ava says, not necessarily. Rabbi Adi bar Ava ama, Hamani Rabbi Yehuda hi. You could say that that Mishnah is Rabbi Yehuda because you forgot something very important, which is what? Well, the altar was a height of 10 Amok. If the altar is situated by the entranceway of the of the um, hechal, remember it, the the the, the, mizbeach, the altar was thirty two cubits wide. If it blocks the space and it's ten cubits high, that adds another ten cubits. So if it's blocking the entranceway, then you can't see through, right? And then that's why you need the height. Remember where the where the mizbeach is, the height is thirteen and a half because you've walked in to the Ezra Nashim and then you've walked into the Ezra Israel, we got to 13 and a half cubits. Add another 10 cubits, it's 23 and a half. So the Mizbech itself could be blocking your view. Forget about whether there was this extra step or there wasn't an extra step. So that's where Vada Barava is gonna suggest. As I said, we're actually gonna reject it for a different reason. But he says, Hamani Rabbi Hudi. Now it all depends on, if you have your Machana Mikdash map, you can look at the Mizbech where it is. And the question is, okay, we're going to see, according to this, the Mizbeach is not in the middle of the room. You see that? The Mizbeach, the, the square of the altar is not centered in the room. So now we're going to look at this and say, Rabbi Yehuda Omer, HaMizbeach memutza ve'omeh be'emtza azara, u'shloshim v'shtayim amor ha'yulam. It was exactly situated in the center of the, of the, um, of the room, okay, in terms of the width of the room. It was centered. And it was 32 amot. Now, eser amot, 10 amot, how op the, the opening to the hechal, just like we said, all the openings were 10 cubits. So 10 cubits was the petach of the hechal. So if it's centered, the hechal was definitely centered in the room. The entrance to it was right in the middle. 
So if the altar is right in the middle, you're going to end up with 10 cubits of the center, the 10 central cubits of the, of the altar are right opposite the entrance into the hechal. Then how much are you left with? 22. Yur alef amal So 12, uh, 11 on either side, so 22 into 2, 11 on either side. So now we're going to explain that's a different reason why you needed, why the height was an issue, right? And why you needed this, a low wall. The low wall that we tried to use is a further proof. Remember, it was our second proof of Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov. The fact to say that Midot is Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov is because of the low wall, right? That low wall could be because of the, the altar, because the altar was centered in the room, according to Rabbi Yuda, and therefore it blocked the entrance to the Hechal. And therefore it would be an issue. Ah, so now, oh, so that's his answer. Now we're going to question that and say, wait a minute. Is, you want to say, according to that, you're going to say, this doesn't prove that Mido was Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov. You could say Mido was according to Rabbi Yehuda. The Gemara says, Isa kadatach Mido Rabbi Yehuda. Mizbech be'em sazara mi mishkachale. Would you really have an altar in the, in the middle of the azara? In other words, uh, let me say it in a better way. I didn't really word it well. If you're going to say Midot is Rabbi Yehuda, and the reason why you needed that height in the, in the low height of the wall of that entranceway on the eastern side was just so that since the altar was blocking your view and not because it was this extra step, like Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov said, then you'd have to say that Midot is Rabbi Yehuda. And according to Masechet Midot, you're basically trying to say the, it's because of Rabbi Yehuda, which means that according to Masechet Midot, the Mizbech must have been in the center of the room. But that's not true, according to Masechet Midot. They're bringing in some other machloket, which isn't mentioned here, which is to say, well, who's to say the author is Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov? The author could be Rabbi Yehuda. But now the Gemara is going to say, but you don't find the Mizbech in the middle of Yazara according to Masechet Midot, and like I said, not according to our map either. And why is that? Because our map seems to generally follow Masechet Midot. I don't know if that's it a rule all across the board, but it makes sense because that's the place where they're really giving you the Midot. So maybe that's the most reliable for the Midot, although, you know, again, it's just different traditions. The Hatznan doesn't it say in the Mishnah, and now we're going to prove from a whole calculation of what the la la layout of the Mishnah was and what the measurements of everything and where the placement of everything was. We're going to see that according to Masechet Midot, they didn't hold like Rabbi Yehuda. They didn't think the Mizbah was in the center, which means that you can't say Masechet Midot was Rabbi Yehuda, which means that you can't say that the wall was low because of Rabbi Yehuda. And we're going to then go back to saying it's Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov. Okay, so to clarify, what they're really doing is they, they prove that it was Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov. And then they, and I'll stop the pictures for a minute and then we'll open them. They proved it was Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov from, right? They said it from a different place. Then they tried to further prove it from this source. And then they reject they try to reject that this source can further prove it about the height of the wall, because maybe you could explain it according to Rabbi Yehuda, to which they say no, because Masechet Midot doesn't follow Rabbi Yehuda, and we're going to prove that right now. And that's going to be basically our last big proof for today. So here, by the way, they have pictures, you can see, of all the heights. Okay, the Shan scene has this also. This has it where they show you the heights of each of the areas. They, they color code it here. They have a whole description at the bottom of what they are. So you can look through the pictures and see. And that shows whether it's 19 and a half or mode or 22 and a half, depending on your, or 20 and a half, right? All the different, sorry, it should be 22. I don't know how they got the 22 and a half. Oh, right. This is because of the altar. So this is where the altar is. Um, you would get to, I don't know why 22 and a half. It should be, maybe it's nine height. I thought it was 10. Oh, the Mizbech was nine. My mistake. The Mizbech was only nine cubits high. So it should be 22 and a half. So that's a mistake I made. Okay. Now we're going to talk about the length and the width of the, of the Azara and what went on in there. So first, we're going to talk about the length, which really isn't relevant to our purposes. Again, all we're trying to prove here is that Midot, the Mishnah Masecha Midot, doesn't go by Rabbi Yehuda, and the Mizbech is not described as being in the center here. Kol Azara, v'hatnan, so it doesn't say in the Mishnah, Kol Azara ita orech 187 aroch av 135. The length was 187. That's what you see in this picture. The length is 187. I'm in picture 39. And the width was 135. So first, let's start with the length. So going from east to west. Okay, what's good about this is, again, as I said, you're going to be much more familiar with the space. So even though the city doesn't really have to do with Yoma, it actually really does. Because 
we're going to see a lot of happenings and goings on inside the temple. And it's really great to be able to see what it looked like and visualize. It. And the pictures, you know, are amazing for that. So let's start. This is where the Israelim can go. This is what we call Israel. Israel. The first section is 11, Yud Aleph Amma. Okay, 11 Amot. That's what I said before. Then, the way the where Kohanim could go, even though Kohanim could go in the whole thing, what they mean, until he gets to the altar, another 11 cubits, 11 Amma. The altar, 32. So we now have 11, 11, that's 22, another 32 is, four, what do we get to? Uh, 22 and 32, so 54. Bain ulam le mizbeach esrim ushtayim. Okay, I'm not gonna do all the math here in class. You can, it's very easy math, you can figure it out. Between the ulam and the mizbeach. So now we're on the other side of the ulam. We're just basically going across the room. Between there, the next section you get to is the ulam. There's a space between the two of 22. We already saw that, esrim ushtayim. Haichal. Me'ama, the hechal itself, including the walls, including all sorts of other things besides the inner space, including the outer space, the inner space it took up, which includes thickness of walls, etc., is a hundred cubits. And then if you see the hechal ends at a certain point and there's still a little space till you get to the other side, that's 11 cubits. Okay, so that whole thing adds up to 187. Now we want to go mina darom latzafon. Now this is the part that's important to us. Okay, here's the bird's eye view of that. Okay, next. Now we want to go from the south to the north. So now if you remember, on the north side, that's where they do the slaughtering. That's because kodshei kodashim shlitatam betzafon. All the kodshei kodashim, like the chatad and the ola and, and the things that are called kodshei kodashim that the people don't eat, right? Other than the shlamim and others. There, all, all the shechita was done in the north side. Therefore, they have what's called the Beit Mikbachayim, which are these rings in the ground where they would put the animals to slaughter. Then we had the tables where they would do work with the animals on there. We had these nanasim, these little beams on the floor, which had hooks on them, where they would hang the animal to take the hide off, right? The other was really for cutting up the pieces, right? They, this was all the slaughtering area. So now we're going to talk about all these parts and how much space they took up. So first, we're going to start on the south side. So if all that was on the north side. Clearly the altar was somewhat on the south side. Again, the debate we had was, is it centered the Mizbeach? Remember there's the Mizbeach and there's the ramp. So no matter what, we don't mean the entire thing. We just mean the base of the altar was centered or is the base of the altar more on the Southern side? So this is gonna be a description of Masechet Midot, which is gonna show it was more on the Southern side, which is gonna show that Masechet Midot doesn't hold like Rabbi Yehuda who thought it was in the center. So now they say, so the whole thing was 135 cubits. The description we get here is not going to be as clear as the other one, because first they're going to skip two sections, including the very beginning. So from the wall to the, to the ramp, we don't get what that measurement was. The ramp and the altar all together was 62. How does this work? Well, the ramp was 32 and the altar was 32. Now you might say that sounds like 64. But the ramp went up to the top. And if you remember, we talked about this yesterday. There was the sovev, which came out and jutted out one cubit from the lower down in the altar, the mid, around mid height. I think it was at five cubits height. Then we have the yesod, which was at the bottom, which jutted out a cubit. So both of those, overla they were overlapping with the ramp. The ramp went up to the top, which was less. So basically the two together, since there's two cubits of overlap, the two together, we drop two cubits off and we end up with 62. So that's 62. Now, next we move in. Um, so the, it was dead space, right? You always need some dead space for people to be able to walk around. So eight cubits over here between both, because you usually, remember we've talked about this many times, four cubits for walking. So four cubits for them to walk for. Sometimes it's one cubit for walking, but when you really want space, you use four cubits. So probably they wanted four cubits for the Beit Mitzvahim space and four cubits for, right? We saw this all with Kilaim and mixed things and all that. Mekoma Tabaot, that space took up a slim Arba, 24. Mina Tabaot, the Shulchanot Arba. From there, there was an again dead space of four cubits. Mina Shulchanot, the Nanasim Arba. Notice they skipped something. What they skip? The tables themselves. 
Some people say they skipped it because it's an explicit pasuk in Yechezkel that describes that the tables were four, took up a space of four cubits. So it was obvious they didn't need to say it. I don't know, either which way, it seems a little strange they dropped it off, but you have to add another four cubits, otherwise it doesn't make sense. And also the whole space the tables took up is totally missing here. So from the tables on the other side to the nanasim, to these little beams, what, or little short stumps was four. Min nanasim, right? They're called nanas as a midget, right? So, uh, or a small something, right? A short something. So a nanas, min nanasim lakota lazara shmona amot. So from these short beams to the wall was another eight cubits. Now, what are we missing? We're missing two things. Forget the shulchanot that they assume we know what it is. But hamota, whatever's left, which is going to be, if you do all the math, you get to 21 cubits are missing here. Split that between the two spaces that they didn't discuss. So we're going to assume 10 and a half for the space between the wall and the, and the ramp, and 10 and a half for the space of these nanasim. So now, what's the, now let's do the math. What was the center of the room? If it was 135. The center of the room is at 67.5, okay, 67 and a half amos. Now the, the Mizbeach took up 62 and then you have 10 and a half. So it took up 72 and a half. If it takes up 72 and a half, it's five cubits on the north side over the halfway point of the room. And the rest of them are in the south side. So it's clearly not in the center. So it's clear here that the altar, you can see it from the picture, was not centered in the room. In which case they say, Ha ruba de bizbach bidaom kai. Right? Therefore, the majority, right? The, according to this description, the majority of the altar is on the south side. In which case, where does that get us to? You cannot say that the Mishnah that talked about the need for that wall to be a low height was because it holds like Rabbi Yehuda and not Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov. And we're back to saying, Alalav Shmamina, Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov, Bishmamina. It must be that that opinion is Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov, that's why you need the short wall, and not because of Rabbi Yehuda, who said that it was the altar that was blocking the view because the altar was centered in the room. And therefore, it's clearly not, it's clearly not because the altar was centered in the room. That's not the reason. It's because it holds Rabbi, Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov. And therefore, we end by back to where we started, where we said, how do we resolve the contradiction between Masechet Midot and Masechet Tamid? We say that Masechet Midot is Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov, and we proved it from the first proof was from the um, the Lishakot, right? Where well, sorry, I have to remember now. We proved it because ah, right. We proved it very simply because it just said there. I forgot what the fourth one was used for, which meant that it must have been Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov talking. Then we further prove it from the fact that the wall had to be short, and that was because of Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov's description of the height that he had this one extra cubit which meant that the height was going to be of the hechal was going to be too tall to be able to see it through the opening of the 20 cubits from the bottom, from the round level of Harabayit. And therefore you needed, that's why it's Rabbi Lezer ben Yaakov, that's why you need the wall to be low so you could see over the wall through the next open area, right? And it couldn't be higher than six cubits, otherwise you'd already be blocked by the next wall over the next gate. Hope that was com comprehensible to everybody. And uh, if it's not, you can look back. The charts on the sheet should help you. The, the description in my shear should help you. And the pictures should really be very useful for this. Like I said, the pictures here, pictures in the shot scene are very good. Um, highly recommended. They have some charts. Again, you know, every, I find some people visualize things in different ways. So the more different, if one doesn't work for you, try a different chart, different ones visualize, you know, show them visually in different manners. Everybody kind of can associate with a different one. Okay, have a good day, everyone.